Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life Alumni Scholars Series. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at the University of Manitoba and a proud UM alumna. I'm also today's moderator. So thank you for joining us. And for if you've been joining us for this entire series, thank you for making this part of your day from wherever you are around the world joining us. This series of the Virtual Learning for Life program is especially exciting as we are able to profile many of our University of Manitoba alumni who are doing amazing things and excelling in every sector imaginable all around the world, proving that alumni are one of the finest examples of how a degree from the University of Manitoba helps make the world a better place. So just a few housekeeping details before I introduce today's speaker. So again, you're watching this via YouTube as you usually do. Uh, and our Q&A platform is slido.com. That's www.slido.com. Uh, the password is VLFL3. You'll notice a pattern week to week. That's the date that we use. Please keep your questions coming through. I check that platform throughout the presentation as well as at the end while we are doing the Q&A. So please always add your questions. For, we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can. So now I would like to introduce our speaker today, Mr. John Amadek. He is a Price Faculty of Engineering grad from the class of 1981. So you might notice that year 81, he's actually celebrating his 40th anniversary of his graduation from the University of Manitoba. Certainly a, a, a wonderful milestone to celebrate. And I'm not trying to make John feel old, but more reflective of his time uh, from the University of Manitoba uh, and certainly thinking about how the U of M has impacted him. So let me tell you a little bit about him. He will be presenting on the topic of out of the dark and unusual projects, a world of opportunities. Now, John is a retired oil, gas and energy professional and was an engineer behind the dramatic rescue of nearly three dozen trapped miners in Chile more than 10 years ago. And so if you if you remember the name John Amadek, you may have recall seeing the alumni point of view story that was in our fall 2020 edition of UM Today, the magazine, uh, where we did profile John and the Chilean minor rescue. And so he will certainly be talking about uh, that as, as a part of his presentation today. So for 37 years, John worked at Sh Schelmerberger. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And he has lived, just listen to the number of places where he has lived uh, throughout his distinguished career. He's lived in Argentina, Venezuela, uh, Chile, Egypt, Oman, Indonesia, Japan, and Australia. And of course, he's lived in Canada, in Winnipeg, for when he was a student at the University of Manitoba. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to John, who will be sharing about his amazing experiences over his career. Over to you, John. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much for uh, sending me an invite for the talk. And as Tracy mentioned, this is the 40th year, or almost 40 years since I graduated. And I thought I'd, the best place to start the uh, the presentation was with a four, with a photo of the class of '81. So basically, there were about forty of us. We ended up after university working different places across uh, Canada, the states. Uh, even two of the people you see in the photos are current professors at the U of M. So it's it's, it's kind of an interesting. It's uh, it's amazing how time has gone back. When I look back at the studies of, at U of M, I remember in the, being in the library, the classroom, studying like crazy, weekends, working to fund my studies in the summer and part-time. What I don't remember seeing was all the nice photos of the social activities and stuff like that that I see in all the brochures and universities uh, nowadays, but it was really a fun time. When I left university, I planned to work uh, one or two years and then return for a master's and do an MBA with really kind of a world of opportunities open to me. Five, da five days after my final exams, I left Manitoba with my engineering degree, a pilot's license, a driving license, and a camera. And really just, uh, again, went out to see, see what I could do, see what I could see, and get some experience. I was fortunate to work with a number of engineers around the world from all different cultures, all different backgrounds. I visited a number of research centers, engineering centers, Silicon Valley, et cetera. So I managed to see a lot of different places, saw really the role of research, the role of education. So in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'd like to explain to you what happened in the Chile mine accident and then a few other projects I've worked on. So the Chile mining accident happened in August of 2010. 
and basically took three months to resolve. Basically what happened in early August was a group of 33 miners entered the mine, went down to the bottom of the mine in a remote area of the Atacama Desert in Chile. A really, really dry place, really, really hot place, uh, especially in the summer and very cold nights in the winter. Basically the mine uh, opened in, the, in about 1890. They basically mined the top of a mountain in the 1920s when diesel engine technology came out, they started to tunnel into it. And basically over the years, it evolved into a long tunnel network, basically nine kilometers or long. So they entered that morning uh, with uh, pickup trucks and vehicles, took, took basically the tunnel all the way to the bottom. When they were at the bottom, they were just starting to get ready to, to work. And then the whole mine fell in on itself and entombed them. So basically they were trapped at the bottom of the mine. When the accident happened, a rescue team was mounted. They quickly entered, uh, well, sorry. In this previous slide in the lower picture here, you see basically the entrance is like a tunnel there. That was the main entrance to the mine. So anyways, when the accident happened, basically the, they entered the mine, they came to a spot where the tunnel just stopped and it was just this rock face. So you see that in the slide. What they did was they used a can of spray paint, that kind of orange color. They ran it along the top of the tunnel. They went back, looked, were looking at different uh, ventilation chutes and stuff. When they came back, the whole paint mark had gone down. They painted another line across the thing. Half an hour later, the whole thing basically came down again. So what they realized was that the mine had completely fallen in on itself. They realized that it was unstable and they realized there was no way they were going to be able to uh, mount a rescue from inside the mine. So the things, you know, at that point in time, things were really dire. It was really dark, right? Basically at the surface, they knew that the mine was unstable. They knew there was no access to the lower part of the mine. They didn't really know how big it was, right? I mean, it turned out to be a 700,000 ton kind of slug that just moved down, but basically they had no feeling for that at surface. They knew they couldn't do anything from entering the mine. They didn't know where the miners were. They didn't know if they were alive. The mining community in the area knew that it was an accident of a completely different scale than anything they had seen before. To compound matters, the second day of the accident, the mine declared bankruptcy. So the families were kind of desperate. Uh, what they say was, you know, we'll go in, we'll get them, we'll go with our picks, we'll go with our shovels. Uh, they wanted to basically enter the mine and try and, if you want, shovel to, the, to their family members. At this point, the person who was in charge of mines and uh, the mines and natural resources basically stepped up and, and took over the whole operation line, which is kind of an amazing thing because basically he was the one that was responsible. You could say he was maybe even accountable for the accident, but he basically rolled up his sleeve and said, you know, we're going to do what it takes. Underground, you had the miners. They knew they were cut off. They knew they had new access to service. They had no uh, communications with surface. They knew they had very limited resources, meaning food, water, and uh, batteries for flashlights. Uh, so they knew they were kind of at the mercy of what was going on on surface, but they had no communication with the surface. So what, uh, you know, the way the whole, re the whole rescue thing started was basically they had in the area some uh, truck mounted drilling rigs that they used for exploratory uh, mining wells. They basically started to drill uh, small holes, five and a quarter, five and three quarter inch holes. And basically they hit the upper part of the mine, uh, didn't find any signs of life. They punched a few more holes, hit the mid part of the mine, didn't find any signs of life. And then on the, I believe it was the 15th hole they made, they entered the lower part of the mine. And when they entered the lower part of the mine, the, the person on the, the rig stopped the rig he thought he heard something. He took a large uh, monkey wrench, uh, hammered the pipe, hammered it a few times, was listening and everything. He wasn't kind of really sure what was going on. And anyways, they basically waited a couple minutes, bang, 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 and then they decided to pull out the pipe. When they pulled out the pipe at about six meters, they saw that the pipe was painted red and they had never been painted. There was no coating on it. And as they pulled the last... Uh, you know, the last couple of meters of the thing out and saw the bit, they found basically a piece of string and a piece of plastic with a piece of paper inside. And basically the piece of paper said, uh, you know, in Spanish, the equivalent of the 30 of three of us are alive, right? So basically um, there was, uh, you know, a hole underground. Quickly they drilled two more holes and very quickly they uh, 
you know, a system was put in place to lower a phone cable, to lower uh, water, to lower food on a type of sound. I mean, basically it was a metal tube with a plug on the end and inside that four inch diameters, they could put sandwiches, they could put some types of medicine, they could put bottles of water. And then really things kind of came to a completely different level because the question really was now what, right? So we knew that, or I should point out that, you know, they, when they, uh, after they pulled out the pipe, they basically lowered a camera and then this image you see on the right on the slide was what was televised worldwide, basically, you know, with the notes and with these images, they knew that they were live. But really the question then came up, so what do we do now? What do we do now? We have basically small holes going down underground, but how do we get the miners out? And there were a couple of different ideas and stuff like that, but the conclusion was no matter what, it had to involve drilling a hole. And when you kind of backed it out, you know, from the size of the average person to a steel jacket that you put in to the actual hole, you came out that basically you needed a 28 inch drill bit. You needed to drill, you know, into the mine. You needed to run the steel jacket, right? And then run this capsule on the right. And if you see the capsule, it's 22 inches in diameter. If you sit inside it, it, you know, I'm not a big person, I'm not a small person, but it was tight for me. So that was really a little bit of the challenge that was involved. The way they started is that if you see on this slide on the left side, they had a mining type rig that in the area, they brought that very, very quickly. They started to drill the hole. And basically this was in August. Their conclusion was the earliest they could finish if they were lucky was by Christmas. So basically, you would have had the miners down four months. And basically after a week, they start to have issues and problems and everything looked like it was gonna take much longer. So then what the kind of second plan or plan B, if you want, they brought in a water drilling rig, a, a water well technology rig, and they used one of the holes that was, pilot holes that was basically drilled down to the bottom and basically they decided to try and enlarge it from top to bottom. That was kind of going good for about a week or so. Then they start to hit some uh, steel cuttings and stuff that was in the uh, mine and kind of ripped apart the bit and they start to have all sorts of issues. So then a plan C came out and the plan C was the one that I was involved. And what the idea with this was, was basically to drill an oil and gas technology type well outside of the mine and basically drill it down and then tuck in underneath the mine. In other words, completely miss the existing network of the mine, completely miss this if you want to visualize it like a giant piston that has shifted and, and uh, entombed the miners. So that was basically how I was involved. And that's basically when I came in was when the, you know, when the conclusion was to try this third approach using uh, technology. The rig was sitting, it was a Canadian rig. It was sitting in customs for two years impounded by Chilean customs, which is kind of a weird story. To give you kind of a feel of the challenge, you know, the challenges involved, the miners were 600 to 700 meters underground, depending where on the mountain you were. So if you take a look at this aerial view of a U of M campus, and if you kind of think of University Crescent, if you were there and you kind of looked down to the admin building and you were at you're looking kind of at, at the Defoe Library, the entrance, and if you pictured there a transit bus on its side, that was basically the target. So if you picture yourself here on University Crescent, you have a drill bit, you're keep adding things to make it go further and further. Every single time you hit a different hardness of formation, the bit will deflect in a different direction. And you're trying to hit the entrance to the library. And that was basically what the challenge was, the, the equivalent of, right? So basically it was started, you had three rigs basically going. Uh, all three of them were trying to drill down. The miners could hear the, um, you know, the rigs basically were, a rock is a good conductor of sound. Anytime one of the rigs stopped, the miners got nervous. There was occasions when all three rigs were stopped. The miners right away were on the on the telephone asking, what's going along? Are you abandoning us? Kind of thing, right? So it was a very, very, the dynamics were very, very uh, tense, if you want. In this photo, actually, the, if you see on top, you see two little kind of... Uh, persons on there it was basically uh, two security forces on horseback. You had security forces in helicopters, you had security forces on uh, uh, motorbikes, uh, everything kind of, everything to kind of protect the area. So basically the, um, the three rigs were drilling ahead, all of them were trying to get to the bottom, all of them were trying to overcome technical difficulties. And it 
just basically was drilling, 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 and the miners basically, you know, how's it going, etc. No, you had a human side that was just amazing, and the human side was all about this hope, the anticipation, the waiting. You had kind of at the entrance to the area, they had set up an area where there were 33 flags, 32 Chilean flags, one Bolivian flag for each of the miners. And on the left side of the slide, you'll see there's basically flags for all the different people involved from different countries. So you obviously had a lot of Latin American people. You had quite a few Canadians, actually. Uh, you had South Africans um, and Americans. So basically, you had a whole lot of people there all focused on trying to get the miners out. And you had some support for the miners that was just amazing. For instance, in these this photo, the upper left one was a couple that was coming from South Chile. They spent two and a half days on a bus to get here, spent two hours, and then went back two and a half days. They were coming from a village where a third of the village was wiped out in a tsunami. And they were basically uh, families that relied on fishing, right? So they came to sh show their support for the miners. The person on the right, was basically running from the nearest town, which was about uh, 30 kilometers away. He's Uruguayan, right? To show his support, you know, Uruguay for Chile, right? And the person on the lower left was the guy who said that if the miners get out, uh, you know, he was going to run all the way to Santiago, which was 900 kilometers. When I took this photo, it was actually after the miners had, had been rescued two days later, about 30 kilometers outside of the mine. So you had this tremendous support from the public, uh, you know, for the miners to you know, do whatever it takes to get them out. So when they actually reached the bottom, uh, you know, the hole was punched in and the miners were pulled out. You, you had on TV, you know, scenes that I think, you know, a lot of people would remember. The scenes I saw was the TV scenes, but I also saw the scenes right at the mine. I saw basically, you know, the wife, for instance, in this picture on the left in red, you know, apprehensively waiting. I saw the president or his wife basically you know, meeting each one of them. I saw the kids, you know, the look in their eyes when they, you know, seeing their father come out was just amazing. I mean, it was a, a an amazing event to see right at mine level, but it was also an amazing event to see uh, in the local town, right? So these were pictures I took uh, one of the nights at about three in the morning. We were basically in the plaza of the town. Everybody was watching on live screens, you know, the rescue. Right? It was an amazing thing to see even in the town to see kind of the hopes of the community, the hopes of the, uh, you know, the miners, other miners, right? Like I said, it was an amazing thing to see. You know, even, even small kids were taken to the plaza. So when, you know, the miners were retrieved, all 33 uh, survived. I think, that, you know, there was kind of some summary and lessons, I think, you know, that are amazing of this whole incident. The accident, first of all, should have really never happen, right? There was a tremendous willingness to help the miners, right, to, to help from all around the world. The Chilean government was extremely open to, to, to help from outside, right? The important thing was that when the accident initially happened, the miners managed the resources they had, meaning they had basically 48 hours worth of food, they had some water, they had some flashlight batteries, but they managed it, they rationed it which was probably the one thing that really saved them. What's interesting was the miners and the rescuers never gave up. Anytime there was a problem, there was some way to, to get around it, right? The interesting thing is, you, you know, you as a, you know, or me, I should say, as an engineering graduate, you could never be prepared for a scenario like this. But when you have these problems comes up, come up, you have to think of solutions, think of ways to, through, to get through it. I think one of the important things to learn from uh, you know, this incident in Chile was to know when to ask and who to ask for help, right? And it's amazing. And I say that was probably one of the strongest things about this thing. A decade earlier, there was an, you know, a bad accident with a Russian submarine, the Kursk, that happened in the North Sea, where the government, everybody kind of kept it quiet. There were resources in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland, Stavanger, Norway, uh, in Holland, but they were never open to, uh, you know, they were never open to having international help or, uh, or resources. A decade after the Chilean one, there was a very, very similar scenario. Where I saw very a lot of similarities with the incident with the uh, the uh, the Thai football team that was uh, stuck in a flooding cave. And that one, they were so open to resources. I mean, very, very similar. So it's amazing how you know three decades apart, three different incidents 
how, if you want, we as the world learned how to address it, how to, you know, how to mobilize resources as needed. I think if I was to summarize, you know, the rescue was an extraordinary engineering and technology event, you know, to rescue the miners. The amazing thing was the conditions of the mine at the mine were really tough, but I never heard a complaint the whole time I was there. So it was a really amazing, uh, really was an amazing event, amazing thing to be, to participate in. Um, there were four, 350, 400 people involved in the rescue. When the actual miners were pulled out, there were 950 journalists <laughs> to give you kind of a feel of the, uh, the scale of the uh, event. In my time working for Schlumberger, I was very fortunate to be involved in a couple other projects. And I just want to kind of share them with you and the way it kind of relates to my time in uh, university and everything. They were all kind of not the ordinary things. They were different kind of things. They were, they were things really, you know, about technology, about trying to make technology understandable. So I, uh, I managed to get involved in uh, creating a new headquarters here in London. And one of the things I really realized was that uh, was that um, a lot of people really didn't understand, uh, you know, what Schlumberger does, what you know, what is energy. I was really surprised by some uh, investment bankers that were talking about all kinds of things, but didn't really know what they were talking about in terms of the, you know, geology and stuff like that. I realized that we had a lot of employees whose kids and family really didn't understand, you know, what their parents did or what Schlumberger did in a physical sense. So, with that kind of agenda. I, um, you know, in this new headquarters, I wanted to kind of sh show that, capture that. And I did it in two ways. The very first one was, you know, I really tried to get to the fundamentals of what uh, my company did. And really, the fundamentals are really determining the, the unknown underground. And the way I represented it uh, was to look for different formations of so sandstone, limestone, shale with fossils. And I wanted to kind of really show you know, uh, different things. So that kind of, and, and I was inspired a little bit by what I saw in, uh, you know, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, and some of the different buildings that had limestone that had fossils on it. I had an uncle who, you know, went through different stone for his fireplace and, you know, looking for fossils. So it kind of, I knew it kind of existed. And then I kind of started, to, uh, if you want, a hunt through friends, suppliers, and stuff like that to see if I could find represented formations with fossils. And I ended up finding, for instance, this one on the left here. Well, I ended up finding a person who was an Indiana Jones type guy who collected these and he could basically mount it. Uh, I mean, you could speak to the guy, you know, come up with some wild things and basically uh, he helped me get the different, source the different bits and help me kind of mount it. So the one on the left came from Algeria, it's sandstone, amazing fossils. The one in the center is basically shale with, uh, traces of oil coming from an outcropping in South Germany. Then I had other pieces coming from China and stuff like that. I had them mounted in every meeting room, in every um, coffee point, every place where we would have visitors or family or, um, well, visitors or family come in. And basically I had stainless steel plates uh, made that basically described it like a museum. You know, what was the reservoir and what was the uh, fossil? And that turned out to be... Uh, it turned out to really surprise people. It really got them curious. I had so many positive fees, uh, so much positive feedback about that. Another thing I wanted to do was capture the uh, the spirit of the company. And so the company was started by uh, two brothers. One was a scientist. The other was an engineer. The father bankrolled them through the end of the First World War for about three years, basically gave them money signed a contract with them and told them to pursue something scientifically and make it commercial. Anyway, to make a long story short, that's how uh, Schlumberger started, the two brothers, and, his, and it grew from there to 130,000 employees. But one of the very first things they did was they, you know, they, they wanted to see if they could map what was underground. And they did it using electrical uh, electrodes, if you want, on the surface and tried to map down. They had a eureka moment when they realized they could take the, that array of electrodes and put it in a hole and see out and see out basically into the hole to see where there was water, where there was oil, where there was gas, where there was shale, where there was sandstone. So I had heard through, uh, you know, that in Argentina, one of the original trucks was there. I had a good friend there. I heard he was kind of involved in it. And anyways, we had a long discussion and decided that we would bring this, I mean, basically restore it and bring it to uh, 
London to put in this new headquarters. So if you see the the bottom film strip, that there's a photo in Argentina in 1929. The second photo shows basically the truck stripped down. Third one shows it finished on a pallet ready to ship to uh, Europe. Third one or fourth one shows it being lifted into the building where we had our new headquarters. The fifth one shows it basically being wheeled in through a 15 millimeter gap on each side. It was put in its spot, a uh, wood cocoon made for it. The building was finished, the cocoon was pulled away. And then basically the pictures on top you, you see are of the actual truck. What the original brothers did was they would drive this to a well site. They would jack the back end of the truck up. They would lower it on railroad ties. And if you see on the on the right picture, left rear wheel, there's what looks like a sprocket. They would feed a chain through there, put it on top of the winch or over around the top of the winch to, to a matching sprocket. And basically somebody would hop in the truck, they'd put it in reverse, the cable would go down the hole, put it in first gear, the cable would come out the hole. So really, really simple innovation, but basically it allowed them to, to map what was underground. Uh, so that, that was basically, you know, basically one of these really weird projects you get involved in. It doesn't relate directly to your, uh, maybe your degree, but you have this kind of knowledge, this thinking approach, um, and you just, you know, if you, if you have a little bit of uh, space, you can come up with some amazing things. Uh, again, you know, it's all on what I realize is you have a lot of opportunities out there in the world. It's just a matter of your imagination, your a uh, little bit of your uh, engineering background, speaking to different people. When I came up with this, the architects thought I was nuts. They were just, I mean, they just said like that. One of our presidents said to me, do you think you can really do this when I propose it? And what I said to him was, you know, if you're asking me formally, the answer is no. But if you're putting it to me and my team as a challenge, we'll definitely figure a way to do it. And it was basically how we ended up doing it. This truck was mounted in an office. It's the, I mean, it's the, one of the headquarters of Schlumberger, but it's also the same building where there's the headquarters of Rolls Royce, the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation kind of thing. So it's in a, it's, 10 minutes from Buckingham Palace, five minutes from New Scotland Yard, and 10 minutes from the Parliament buildings in the UK. So it, it was in an area where the security was just amazing. Uh, to get the permits and everything and the, uh, uh, or the whole thing was just uh, painful. But at the end of the day, it was completely worth it. There were also three other things, three other opportunities I had on, the, on my personal side that really kind of jumped out. Uh, and I, and and just there were things that uh, you couldn't plan. They just kind of happened. They just appeared. One of the ones was in the uh, late eighties. I was back in uh, Winnipeg on vacation. I was going back to a remote area in Australia, and I heard about that the Concord was going to this air show in the states and everything. And I was, you know, super interested in aviation and everything like that. And through kind of a, a lot of luck a few phone calls and everything, I managed to get on the Concorde from Toronto to this air show. It flew three times over the air show. It landed. I spent three days there, and then I got on the Concorde back to Toronto. I managed to, to spend a, a few minutes in the cockpit in flight. So it was kind of an amazing opportunity that just came out of the blue. So it was one of the things that really, you know, on the personal side, uh, since I left U of M, uh, it was just so different, right? And pure luck. Another thing I wanted to do with the very first, my first assignment was in South Chile, right when the Falkland Islands War broke out. And then I was doing a number of trips on uh, when I had some time off and everything like that. And I wanted to go to Antarctica and I made a few inquiries and there was a way to do it through the Chile, uh, Chilean Navy, but I just couldn't manage it. But 15 years later, an opportunity came up and I managed to go on an icebreaker for three months, or three weeks, I should say, to Antarctica, South Georgia, and the Falkland Islands. And that was kind of an amazing opportunity experience. It was, again, a little bit of luck. It was uh, a little bit of perseverance, but it uh, I managed to get it together. I, uh, my fiance at the time managed to come with me, so it, it really worked out well, but it was something that was just, uh, if you want an opportunity that I was able to make happen. And finally, about two years ago, a very good friend of mine, just out of the blue, uh, said, hey, uh, would you like to come on a, on a race? Uh, so these are the maxi race yachts. So long story short, I'm, you know, I, 
I got to go for uh, three of the days on the race. There was a, basically a, a crew of 20 professionals. Two of them were Olympians. The um, navigator had gone three times around in the Volvo Cup around the world race. The strategist had, has the most time of, on the around the world races. But I basically spent two days with this team in different races. And it was just an amazing opportunity just out of the blue. So sometimes you're lucky uh, and you really get to see different things. It was an amazing thing because the, the, uh, the vessel was made out of Kevlar. The whole thing was about efficiency, about uh, you know, gaining a knot or two, about strategy. Uh, it was something I'd never seen, never experienced before. It was really an eye opener. I only had two roles in this whole race. One was to be ballast dead weight, you know, in the right spot, and the second not to fall over, over to forfeit the race. That's basically, uh, that's basically, uh, you know, the main points I wanted to discuss. When I look back at my time of U of M, I say they were very, very, uh, I'm very fond of it. And, you know, I really had a good time. Uh, my degree opened really a world of opportunities, both professionally, both um, personally. I've, in this, you know, in these different photos that I took, I've tried to highlight the things that were really different, not the ordinary stuff. I think it, you know, my degree was really a foundation for uh, the future. It was a way of thinking. It was a way of approaching problems. Um, it was probably more important than any specific thing I learned with, you know, any specific course content. It was really just the way you think of things, the way you approach things. I think one of the other things I've really seen is the role of universities, the roles of research, the roles of science, how it all comes together, the value of it. And that's probably one of the, if you want my reflections looking back, that really stand out. So I think we can open it for questions, Tracy. Super. Thank you very much, John. That was really fascinating. A nice array of projects that you share with us. So we do have a few questions that have popped up already, but just a reminder to, to, to people to please go to slido.com and VLFL3. So uh, the questions that have come up have been about the first project you talked about. So the first one is the Chilean mine considered hard rock mining. So yes, it is a hard rock mine. It was a gold and copper mine, but definitely hard rock. It's not like the coal mines, you know, when you hear the, the explosions and stuff like that. No, it's definitely a hard rock mine. Okay, perfect. Um, if you want to bring the screen back up again, uh, Teddy and David, there's more questions. Are cave in common uh, in copper mines? Yeah, you know, the definitely the intention is not to have it definitely the way the the way the mining companies manage it is not to have cavens the problem with this mine was that it was basically from the 1890s you know and one of the first slides that showed it was kind of like a spiral going down the, you know the the network spiraled down they kind of ate into the middle obviously the older part of the mine the part from let's say the early 1900s is the is the part that really wasn't engineered kind of with today's standards and it's the part that fell in. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question was the drilling done with large diameter rock drills. Yeah, exactly. So the, the um, it was done two ways. On the first and second rigs, it was done with basically reaming. So a small pilot hole was drilled and they either reamed you know, coming up the hole or going down the hole. And on the third well, it was basically a 28 inch tricone bit for hard rock. A very, very special bit for hard rock. Not many of them existed in the world because it's not commonly used. It's not used in the oil and gas industry. It's not used in mining. Mm. Okay. Actually, the, the bit that we were using just kind of out of interest sake actually came from Kuwait. It, oh. it's something normally takes three to four months to fabricate, but there was one sitting, if you want, on the shelf, so to speak, in Kuwait. Super, thank you. And how many days, just a reminder, how many days were the miners trapped for again? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't so clear on that. They were trapped a total of 70 days. So seven zero? Seven zero. So wow. when the accident happened, it was 17 days before, you know, the, the, the small pilot hole was drilled and they were, you know, people realized that their miners were alive. And then the total time they were underground was 70 days, which is amazing. 
And you said, did, did I hear correctly that you said that they had enough food and water for 48 hours? That's correct. So normally, you know, normally I think when there's mining accidents, they kind of assume they'll be able, you'll be able to get in within a day, something like that, right? There's vertical shafts, stuff like that, right? These got completely wiped out, right? So basically they just had enough to survive a day or two. The most amazing thing is the person who was the foreman, I mean, if you watch the movie and stuff, they talk about the thing, it's kind of a reality thing, but they talk about the foreman leading everything. The main thing that he did was basically ration the food, you know, because for 17 days, and that's the amazing thing, you know, they, they knew they needed to ration. They didn't know how long they would be looking for them, right? So they managed to stretch out, you know, last 17 days, which was amazing. In the, uh, oh yeah, I mean, I, that's basically the, the main point. I would say one thing, you know, when these first 17 days when they were drilling, you know, the miners were underground. When a drill bit was going, they were getting noise like you wouldn't believe. I, I mentioned earlier that sound really uh, gets conducted well in rock. So as they were kind of drilling, you know, trying to poke these holes into the upper part and lower part, every single time they stopped, the miners through their mind was going, have they given up? Have they given up? Right. Mm -hmm. So the first 17 days was they must have been on pins and needles every single time. Mm -hmm. you know, the drill bit stopped because the noise would have stopped, right? They would have gone from very noisy environment to complete silence, right? Right, no, I can't imagine how that would play with your psyche. Um, so th there's still some more that I still have to, to bring through the forefront, but the next one is why do you suggest that the accident shouldn't have happened? So the reason I say it shouldn't have happened is, you know, with modern mining techniques, modern modeling, you know, the mechanics and everything like that, you know, the understanding of it, Normally it wouldn't happen, you know, you, they would, it would never be designed so weak, right? So that's why I'm saying it shouldn't have happened. The other thing was that, the other thing was this was kind of, if you want, like a rogue mine, right? It was a very, very small thing. It was just kind of going, it was beyond the economic normal life of a, of a mine, right? You know, the Chilean mines, the, the main mining company in Chile is so professional. This was completely the other end of the spectrum, right? So that's why I'm saying it should have never happened. Probably shouldn't have been working. There was two neighboring mines that had been closed for years, right? Next door to this one, you know, that were uh, in the same sort of time frame, right? Of operations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a number of other questions have popped up. So um, of the three plants, which made it to the miners? Um... Yeah, so there were, there were three, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C. The one that got first to the bottom of the hole was plan B. So it was basically the water drilling. It was basically using one of the existing wells and enlarging it. It was supposed to be a 28 inch hole. It, there was some issues at the bottom. They had to shift to a 26 inch bit. And then basically what had to happen was that they couldn't run the steel jacket. So basically the well I was on or the plan I was on was the C one was just kind of standing by. If the uh, capsule had gotten stuck or there was any problems then basically we would have continued drilling, which was about another day and a half, and we would have run the steel jacket or casing, as it's called. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is: Was there any form of compensation for the miners? There was. I mean, I, I can't really answer that directly. You know, directly wholeheartedly there was something that happened the first couple days after where they did get some money and did get some if you want more like a grant now did they get more longer term compensation and everything i don't know about that part but they did get something in the short term and the families did they were taken care of actually uh through the whole incident and you had said that the next day that the that the accident happened that the the mine went bankrupt so yeah, exactly. I mean, basically the, I mean, they basically went bankrupt and the, you know, families wanted to get into the mine with shovels and stuff. So I mentioned the minister for, you know, mines and natural resources. I mean, he basically stepped up to the plate, got everything moving. The Chilean national copper company. I mean, he brought in uh, mining engineers from there, you know, to start the rescue. So that, that part was really impressive, really impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't know all the background of it. So it was, I'm really nice. It's nice to hear how much support there was for this mission within the country and, and around the world. So some more questions that have come up. The next one is given the bankruptcy of the mining operations company, who financed the rescue mission? What a great question. 
So the majority of the finances was taken over by the, I mean, the Chilean government, right? I mean, the mining minister, the president, they were there every other day, right? When the actual rescue was happening, when the miners were built, being pulled out, the president was there, his wife was there. One of the two of them met every miner. I mean, basically went, got their family together. They were in kind of like a little tent besides the uh, hole. And then basically as the miner came to surface, either the president or his wife, you know, went with the, the wives and the kids to meet the miner, to receive the miners as they came out of the hole, right? And, and that, how of course, was all televised live, right? Oh, it was, okay. Which was amazing. I mean, you know, what was amazing was they ran a fiber cable down to the, you know, into the well, mm -hmm. uh, into the bottom, and basically filmed it underground and filmed it on surface. And you said there were 33, right? Is that the number of miners? 33, yeah, exactly. And how long would it have taken them for to, for every single one? Like how, how long of a time span does that take for 33 people to come out of a mine? So it took about 45 hours. Okay. Uh, 40 something hours. I mean, each each one had about, um, it was about a 20 minutes to pull them out of the hole. So basically from the time they got into this very tight capsule to when they were pulled out was, you know, 20 odd minutes long, right? If you see the uh, you know the photo where I had the summary where it was me in the capsule that was the next morning that was six seven hours after the last one was pulled if you look you know if I if you kind of notice in that photo the capsule was pretty beaten up it wasn't obvious that that was you know every miner was going to be pulled out or I mean it wasn't obvious huh? I mean the conclusion was maybe it wasn't going to last the capsule they had three basic capsules it wasn't clear if the whole you know if uh, some of the rock could fall in and then basically we need to go to the next well Right. finish drilling that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. The next question is, um, would you please tell us about any equipment used these days to detect non-stability of mining grounds? So, I mean, my background isn't mining, right? But there are sensors and stuff like that. Uh, you know, in, in modern mining operations, they do have sensors underground. They do, even before that, would basically have a mechanical modeling, right, of the whole... Uh, you know, the underground network, if you want, uh, of the mine, right? So you'd have a combination of the two things. One is, you know, the the mapping plus the mechanical integrity, and the second would be the sensors, right? But I think the sensors, I don't think normally it would be just a slow creep. It would be more like a big slip, right, would be the mechanism, more like an earthquake type of thing, right, than a slow landslide. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the next question is, uh, what depth were these miners rescued from again? So they were rescued from a little over 600 meters. Wow. Yeah, so it was the deepest, deepest uh, rescue from a mine, uh, the deepest one, right? And that was at the time, the whole thing that was going on in the news with this has never been done before. There'd been a couple, one or two, you know, retrieval of miners in a capsule done in the, previous year in different parts of the world, but they were very shallow. My company had done something in the 70s, well, I should say late 60s, you know, in one accident in Germany and one accident in France, right, where they had retrieved miners. And so it, it's happened a few times and using a capsule to, to pull out miners has happened a few times over the years. But again, it should be happening less and less. Right. right. Has there been any, any uh, mining rescue since then at that depth? Or is that, does that still remain the, 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 the furthest down miners have been rescued from? There was an incident like three weeks ago in China where there was an accident uh, mining, mm -hmm. but they were rescued from within the mine. Oh, I see. Okay. And that was deeper than 600 meters? No, it wasn't deeper. Oh. No, no, no. It hasn't been deeper, no. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next question is, um, have you any information on as to the miners' lives after they were rescued? And did many return to mining and how were their daily lives impacted? So the, you know, the area is a very, very poor area. The miners, you know, the job was, I'm not gonna say they were very well compensated, right? They were taken care of. There was, uh, there was some issues with some of them, uh, you know, a year down the road. I mean, they worked in this mine, so they didn't, have an obvious job anymore, right? Because this mine closed, right? But mm -hmm. what you did hear kind of at the one year point was that the, you know, most of them had been taken care of, but not all of them returned to mining. I, I don't know the details really, right, of, of all of that. 
different scenarios. I was expecting that something would be said, you know, on the 10th anniversary, which was last October. But it, I think because of the pandemic, there was some, some reports in the news in Chile, but nothing internationally, which normally I would have thought they would have said something about the miners, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 10 years on. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, more questions about, uh, about this particular rescue. What drilling fluid was used? So on the plan A and plan B, there was no drilling fluids used. It was dry hole, right? On the third one, which is the one that I was involved in, there was basically drilling mud was used until uh, about 60 meters from the end. And then basically what was used was air. So it was basically air drilling. So in other words, you use compressed air. Okay. One comment I would say was, would be there, is that when that happened, it was amazing the area because you, ha you know, the, uh, this rig was about a thousand horsepower was the normal part of the rig. And then you had 5,000 horsepower of compression. So you had 6,000 horsepower of engine running. Plus you had the other two rigs, which were, I mean, much smaller, but the noise in the area was just unbelievable, right? Really unbelievable. It was just so much going on in such a tight space. One of the biggest issues was making sure nobody would get hurt right. in this kind of industrial environment. And that was one of the roles I took too, is I took a, I mean, did a lot of translating between Spanish and English. I. Um, I took a lot of uh, film crews, the Discovery crew, BBC crew, you know, they wanted to film and everything. And one of the things was to get, you know, basically move them around. You know, when a person would get behind a camera, it was so easy for an accident to happen because they were so kind of uh, focused on it, right? So, you know, a couple of the funny things I did was just basically taking them around, making sure nobody got hurt while they filmed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting you say that. I don't think many of us who've been on site with things like that would even think about that. But, uh, you know, trying to get the best video or, or, or uh, pictures comes at a cost, I can imagine. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, so you, next question is, so you had, you had mentioned that the, that the, the mine went bankrupt the following day. But was the mine finally closed down? Yes. I mean, it was sealed, completely sealed. Okay. All right. The next question is, um, how long did you say it took before the miners rescue, before the miners rescuers realized miners were alive? How long did you say? Oh, it 17 days. 17 seven, days, right. The 17 days, these pilot holes, small holes, right? When one finally pierced the lower end and basically when uh, they lowered a camera and saw the face of a person and, and read his note, that was the fir first point that they knew they were alive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you know how the order of the miners getting to come to the surface was determined? I do. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what they did was the, you know, first they, you know, they kind of had a ranking system, if you want, and who was the most fit, who was the uh, least effective. So they, you know, they basically, one of the the very first person that went up was one person that was in real good physical shape and everything wasn't claustrophobic. Once that was kind of determined that it was viable, it was feasible and everything like that, then they started to pass up the people that needed it for medical reasons first. So basically, if you want the people that were more, fragile is not the right word, but basically it was done like that, right? And then at the very end, the foreman was the last person of the miners to go out and then a special forces person was the absolute last person to go out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine if you're claustrophobic how that would feel uh, being rescued in that in that capsule. Yeah, you know, the capsule, like I mentioned, was very tight, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, going out, it, it was pretty banged up when it was finished. And you see it had scars on it. The ride out wasn't smooth by any means, right? So you mm -hmm. can imagine you're in there, you're getting banged around like crazy. It's, yeah, 20 minutes. It's, I mean, there was a light mounted, there was an intercom mounted in the inside, right? But still, it was banging around. If you, you know, if you, if it got jammed in there, could you imagine you're there and you can't go up, can't go down? I mean, the capsule had a system in it that you could actually release the top part of the capsule and lower it down, kind of like a second chance mechanism, right? But mm -hmm. still, it wasn't wouldn't be something you'd want to do on purpose to to go in a capsule like that. Huh? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question, but it's different from the rest, which is, you know, I'm, I'm guessing this is probably from a new grad or maybe a student. And do you have any space for co-op students within your company and how can one apply? Now, I understand that you're retired, so you're probably not working directly there, but you know, what kind of advice could you 
offer for some of our new grads or, or young alumni or people changing into their careers? No. Yeah, so I mean, you're right. I'm I'm retired. I still do a little bit of work with Schlumberger, but basically, I'm retired. Um, the oil industry, the gas industry, with COVID right now, is in really you know in a tough times. There's a few people still being hired. I mean, they have on the Schlumberger website. They basically take interns, co-op students, and uh, things. So I, I mean, my advice would be to apply, try. Right? Mm -hmm. If you're interested in uh, I mean, if you're interested in technology, you're interested in energy, try, go to the website uh, and, and apply. Do they have Canadian offices? Yes. Okay. I mean, you know, so Schlumberger is a company that's as international as it gets. I think it's last count was about 90 different countries, 100 and something nationalities of engineers, right? It's a very, very diverse company, stuff like that. It does have Canadian offices. Uh, Alberta area, I think Saskatchewan, there's an office, definitely in St. John's, Newfoundland is an office. There's various offices around. Mm -hmm. And what's this areas of specialty? I'm sorry? What's this areas of specialty? Like what is the company most known for? So Schlumberger is most known for, well, hiring engineers, right? It really, it's a very, it's a technology company. I mean, engineering is at its roots. So I'd say the most common is engineering and then support of that. So yeah, I mean, it's obviously finance, HR type people, mm -hmm. geophysicists, petroleum engineers, uh, and also, so that's kind of the general you know, field operations. Also, uh, it's a large employer of people with PhDs in research. I mean, it has two research centers and about 70 engineering centers, right? So oh, in that sense, it's very, very large for that. Mm -hmm. A great, a great avenue for graduate students once they've once they've achieved a PhD. Okay, that's great to know. Um, let's move to some more some more questions on the Chilean rescue mission. Now, I think you answered this question, which is, were there any fatalities? And I think everyone survived. Is that what you said? Everybody survived. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, next one. Why was the rescue device tube manufactured with expanded metal on a portion of the tube? So. What you saw in that picture, you know, which was, I think it was green color, was kind of a mesh screen. So what you had was basically, a, I mean, it was a capsule, solid on top, solid on bottom, right? And in the middle, basically uh, four pieces of steel that held these two parts together, plus then mesh all the way around to protect the miner, right? So that's the way the, uh, the way it was manufactured. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question is, uh, was there a risk of drowning the miners from the water used when drilling? So, so there, there, I mean, that was a concern in one of the wells, the third well, right? The one, the one I was involved in. Um, and that's why the decision was made to switch to air drilling for the last bit. Ah, uh, okay. Right? okay. So even though the volume of water that you would have used when drilling wasn't enough to completely fill the well, or the, the mine, was still, still kind of said this was too dangerous. The best option was to drill with air. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the, the second question before the, the first one here, which is how much space did the trap miners have? So I assume the question is underground. Yes. They had, uh, they had a lot of space. <laughs> underground. They had heavy equipment. They were kept busy because the first and sec second well, all the metal cuttings that were ground out with the bits dropped to the bottom. So they had to kind of clear that away. They were getting diesel through the holes so they could run the, uh, you know, the front end loader to help them kind of move. But they had enough space to it. I mean, they had a plenty of space. What they didn't, I mean, what wasn't so great was the temperature was very high. It was like about 91 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that all the time. Oh and the humidity God. was quite high. I mean, what they were extremely lucky was nobody was hurt when the accident happened. They were lucky that there was water underground and they were very lucky that there was natural ventilation. Right. So these were really the things that, you know, allowed everything to come together. Right. I'm not sure how you sleep in that kind of weather. That's not well. <laughs> no, I wouldn't think so. And the other thing was the noise from drilling wasn't wouldn't no. have been fun for them either. Right? No. Yeah. So, I mean, I know the mission was to rescue the miners, but you're talking about how that there was also, there was materials and equipment down there. Was any of that uh, brought up as well? No. No, just the miners. Completely, just the miners. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
The next question we have is, do you feel that with an engineering degree, there is a job for you if you want one? So, so first of all, that's a really interesting question, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, extremely interesting question. And, and I think the, so I think when you, you know, the engineering science technology, right? There's been kind of a focus on it recently, right? I think you see, you know, a lot of things the last decade were around software. Now it's getting to be more to the side, the, you know, the, the what's behind the software, which is really, where really the science and the engineering comes from, right? And you see it where you really see it, for instance, I think what's really hit people is on the side, side of science and engineering is, for instance, with the whole COVID thing with the vaccines, right? The vaccines, you know, you know, the, there's the famous story about, uh, you know, the person in Oxford who in one weekend created the, the solution for the virus, right? Well, at the end of the day, she has been working on it six years, right? And if you hear the story also of the Pfizer one in, um, in BioNTech, right, in Germany, you know, the husband and wife team, they were working on cancer drugs for three, four years and then readapted to things. So I think the focus now of science, the focus of engineering, Right, with some of these, uh, you know, as a result of COVID and some of the other things, is really kind of going to come more forward, right? It's going to become more important, right? Same thing, you know, with the whole electric cars, all that kind of thing, you know, there's basic engineering need, there's basic technology. So I think it's coming back stronger than ever. I think right now, you know, I have two sons that are actually in university, right? So, you know, the things look pretty gloomy right now in terms of jobs and in terms of internships, right? But I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities coming up in the uh, in the uh, next year or so. I think it's hard to pin it down exactly what it is, right? But there will be opportunities, and they'll be very different. May not be so predictable, and that was actually one of the reasons why I put the tagline on the front slide. You know, world of opportunities, because there were so many things I saw in my career that came up out of the blue, both on the professional side and on the uh, personal side. I think you know there's been kind of a reset button right now because of COVID that's going to open things up. But you know, if you ask me to predict it, I couldn't. But there will be opportunities, and it, you know, the role of science, technology, engineering will really take a step up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting what you say because I've got two boys, and uh, I've been talking a lot about engineering to them. It, engineering to me just seems like a discipline where there is a lot of opportunities. It's not just your standard civil engineering, electrical engineering. You're not just building buildings and roads, but there's so many things, as you're saying, you know. And and when you're talking about COVID, that there's many different directions and avenues for you to go in with engineering. And and if I just think about the University of Manitoba, we opened a new building as part of the Price Faculty of Engineering the Stanley Poly building and just seeing what's going on in some of those spaces is unbelievable you know sending a rocket ship to space they're making artificial skin and I mean and those are only two of the things but there's so many neat things that are being done that we're on the cusp of and 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 I'm sure like other universities too so it's exciting to see uh, what's going what's what's happening in the field of engineering yeah for sure right and I, and I think the important thing like I tried to say earlier was, you know, the important thing is it's a, it's an approach. It's a way of thinking. It's a way you address the problem. That's probably the most important thing you pick up in university, right? Is how to think, how to approach problems, how to manage things. Uh, you know, when I look back over the last 40 years, I, I'd say that's probably the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Any final comments, John? I see that's the last of our questions that we have on slide and we're almost out of time, but is there anything you wanted to to end the discussion with? No, I mean, thank, thank you, first of all, for the invite and thank you for uh, letting me present. I think, you know, if you're a university student, if you're a graduate student or a recent graduate, you know, like we are just saying a, few, a minute or so ago, there's, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities coming, right? I don't, like I said, I don't think you can pick it out, you know, what it is exactly, but there will be opportunities. Uh, the question is just being there and being open about it and then, uh, jumping on a few of them that come up. So I think things will be better. I think if you look at the Chilean miners, you know, the whole thing was about hope and perseverance. Probably two things to learn from the Chilean miners that probably very appropriate, you know, right now. Uh, they were they were underground 70 days. You know, we've been here in Europe 90 days, or not yet, about 90 days now, kind of in semi-lockdown, but there's nothing compared to the 70 days that they had, right? So I think, again, you know, the 
there's something to learn from there. It's persevere and uh, hope. Mm -hmm. I think that's a nice segue to also, I think getting a university degree also provides, it's, it takes a lot of perseverance and it gives you hope, right? In terms of all the options that you have for the future. So thank you so very much, John, for that really interesting presentation. Uh, everybody who's listening, we will be sending you as we usually do, a link to this recorded presentation uh, by, through YouTube. We'll also be sending you a survey. We hope that you do respond and provide us your feedback as it's the only way we're able to improve. And also please share if you have you know thoughts or topics or other possible speakers please share we're, we're always eager to to get that feedback and we do listen to it and we do act on it so next week if you have not signed up for it i highly recommend that you do our next speaker is dr Gigi osler and she will be speaking on hot health topics for 2021 which means we can go in a lot of def different di uh, directions with that particular topic if you don't if if you are on instagram I encourage you to check out Dr. Osler's uh, account on Instagram. She shares a, a huge wealth of knowledge of hers as a, as a physician on a variety of health topics. Uh, so just so you can get learn a little bit more about Dr. Osler, uh, but she'll be speaking on a variety of things. And it'll be a little bit more like a fireside conversation between she and I. I suspect one of the topics that will that will arise in, in the conversation is about COVID-19 and the rollout of vaccinations. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Don't forget to register for next week, and we will see you then. Thank you.